Please welcome Dr. Desmond Ford. All of us were born as question asking people, but we were born without the answers. Doesn't matter what country, doesn't matter who your parents were, doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, educated or uneducated, we have the same questions. Who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? Why should I exist? How should I live? What will happen after death? Is there a God? <clears throat> Science can't answer these questions. Aesthetics, art, music can't answer them. Education can't answer them. Only religion sets out to answer them for millennia all over the world. And in Christendom, religion speaks through a preacher. How wonderful that there should be somebody who can give answers to our basic questions, answers that are worth more than money can buy. For example, the preacher's talking to a group of young people. They want to know how to live. He said, prioritisation, that's the clue. 80% of what you do only has 20% of value. 20% of what you do has 80% of value. Prioritisation. Jesus knew it. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Or another group of young people and like they're adults, they're after happiness. And the preacher says, if you're looking for happiness, you'll never get it. But if you realise that life is discipline, duty, service, if you realise that and fit in with that truth, you'll find happiness overflowing. But remember, only through Jesus Christ can you live a disciplined life. So whatever a good preacher says in Christendom, he has to start and finish with our Lord Jesus. Now, Ellie's idea, I think, is a splendid idea, but I'm a bit embarrassed with my topic because I fall short of every ideal that I advocate as regards preaching. My ideals are my ambitions. They are not ever my accomplishments. Today we will look at two features only. Lord willing, in two weeks' time, I'll talk to you about the miracle of memory, how to remember what you want to say. Don't use pages. That's a block between you and your listeners. They think if you don't know it, why should they? So we'll talk about memory. We'll talk about how to put a talk together, how you seize on an introduction and how you find a conclusion. No good having the head of a lion at the start and the tail of a rat at the end. <laughs> so we'll be talking about how to organise a talk and how to put it together, how to remember it and how to motivate it. So we seek God's help in that. But today the two most important themes, the man and the message. When I say the man, I mean the human because there are many women that speak better than men. But many, many women have outstripped their male contemporaries. Catherine Booth, the mother of the Salvation Army, was one such. Annie Whittall Smith, who wrote the book about basic Christian living, she was a wonderful speaker, Europe, England, everywhere she went, America. So when I say the man and the message, I mean the human, humans and the message. A famous cynic, Lord Morley, speaking about speaking, public speaking, he said there are only three things. Who says it? How does he say it? What does he say? And of the three, the third is the least important. Now remember, he's a cynic. But there's some truth in what he says. Your presentation will have no more credit than you already have. St Francis went for a walk one day with one of his followers 
they walked right through a town and his followers said, Francis, I thought we were going to preach. Francis said, that's what we've been doing. Everybody's been watching us. We've been preaching. You see, everything reveals us. Our facial appearance, our past, our present. We give ourselves away. And you can't give away what you haven't got. Spurgeon had many things to say on this subject. He said, it's not great talents that God blesses. It's nearness to Jesus. Have you got it? It's not great talents that God blesses. It's nearness to Christ. Why did Luther win thousands? He was so exultant about the grace of Christ. He was so full of joy with the gospel. People leapt out of the darkness into the light. Who says it? How it's said? What is said? Number one, who says it? Who says it? Spurgeon said a holy preacher is a wonderful weapon in the hands of God to cut down sin and sinners and to offer eternal life. Wonderful preacher. And what is a wonderful preacher? Well, he preaches first to himself whatever he's going to present to others. You know, if a man has heart disease, it affects his lungs, his stomach, his muscles, his nerves. He's got that one disease that affects everything. Well, if a preacher lacks dedication to the gospel, everything else will sicken and die. So what is preaching? Preaching is the art of preparing a sermon and delivering it. No, it's not. Preaching is the art of preparing a preacher and delivering that. A real preacher has fire in the belly. He can't speak with the Holy Ghost without being enthusiastic. That word means God indwelt. The law in the Old Testament was there shall always be a fire on the altar and it shall never go out. Preaching is the hardest task in the world and the most rewarding. Every conscious hour of the day, the preacher is aware that soon he has to confront fellow sinners. And how can he do that? Because no preacher can convert anybody. I remember a camp meeting, a dear lady come to me, came to me, Dr. Ford, I want you to talk to my husband. I'm not going to bring him. I want you to convert him. Madam, I'll be happy to talk to him, but I can't raise the dead. Every preacher bears every conscious hour the burden that soon he has to offer himself to God so that God might speak through him and touch something that's dead and give it life. What a responsibility is that. What a responsibility. Spurgeon said when we preach, we are watched by thousands of eagle eyes. But you must so live that where all the inhabitants of heaven and earth and hell were added to the list, you couldn't care less if you're living right. So you can't be a good preacher unless you're living very close to Christ the most difficult thing in the world because it calls for constant self-surrender and none of us like that. So preaching is the art of preparing a preacher and delivering that, not preparing a talk and delivering that. You cannot say any more than what you are. Let's talk now about the message. That's a little bit about the messenger. Let's talk a little bit about the, the message. 
despite the fact there are many divisions within Christendom and within paganism, there are really only two gospels. There are really only two religions. The most popular one and the one that has the most failure has for its main message, be good and God will love you. This is quite false. It is not true that if you're good, you'll be saved. Who could be good enough? What is true that if you're saved, you will be good. That's true. But Christianity is a come-as-you-are party. I like that because I never feel altogether right. There's nothing in my past or present to boast about and all the things that the law of God demands of me, perfect motives, perfect nature, perfect words, perfect thoughts, perfect deeds, doing the best possible thing every moment of time. That's what the law demands. I can't do it. I am bent to sin as the sparks fly upwards. So the most popular religion in the world says be good and God will love you, but it's asking an impossibility. No one can do it and it's too late anyway. Suppose you reform today and do everything right. Never say a harsh word at home, never say an unkind word about people outside the home giving your life to God of all it's got. Well, what about your past? You may forget it, but can God forget it? What about your past? The gospel, the true gospel. For the little flock, you know, one day the saved of heaven will seem as multiple as the stars and the grains of sand on the seashores a mighty multitude that no one can count, but it will be very small compared with those who've been members of the other religion and who have never known Christ, to whom he will say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I have never known you. The New Testament says, this man receiveth sinners. He's gone to be guest with him that's a sinner. He justifies the ungodly. I never forget it and I always laugh about it. But one of my fellow students in the 1940s who belonged to the first religion that I've mentioned in later years, he would tell audiences, you know Des Ford, he's going about saying God justifies the ungodly. Of course, he didn't know I was quoting from Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. And he thought that was an awful thing. But that is the gospel. He justifies the ungodly. And if he doesn't, I have no hope. So the most popular religion has a popular dictum that's quite false. If you're good, God will save you. Because we can't be good without him. And we can't undo the past. The wrong religion majors in what creatures can do, what we can do, and minors in what God has done. True religion does the opposite. It majors in what God has done. He sent forth his son to die for sinners. The Pharisees came to Christ and said, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? He said, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. True religion majors in what God has done. What we do is a drop in the ocean. False religion majors in law and minors in love. Do, 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 cock-a-doodle-do. That's false religion. True religion, it's done. It's done. It's finished. 
receive it. It's yours. False religion stresses what God requires of us. Or if you look at that, it'll overwhelm you unless you know the gospel because he requires a heart that's always loving, always kind, always forgiving. I don't have a heart like that. So false religion stresses what God requires of us and it sets forth Christ an example. I used to hear it. If Christ could keep the law perfectly and he took our nature, you can and you must and you'll be lost if you don't. What a horrible monstrosity of a religion to think that you and I could do as well as Christ. What a monstrosity. We were born in sin of sinful parents. He came into the world like the first Adam without sin, filled with the Spirit. He naturally hated evil and loved righteousness. I was born in the world loving evil and hating righteousness. So the religion that says he's our example, that's a desperate, despairing, fatal faith. Amen. Wicked. The other religion says Christ is our substitute. He took our place. He was sinless. And we have no other knowledge in the world than this, that we have sinned and God has suffered, that we have become the righteousness of God because God has become the sin of man. Paul was once a disciple of the first religion. And when he looked closely at the law and saw that every one of those commandments was microscopic as well as macroscopic, and it touched on every thought, every feeling, as well as every deed, then he said, I was alive without the law once. When the law came, sin revived and I died. And he says, I through the law became dead to the law. When you see the depths of the law, there's only one way out and that's Christ. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. And if our thoughts can't get there, how can our character, nature, words and deeds get there? The law demands perfect character, perfect motives, perfect nature, perfect thoughts, perfect words, perfect deeds, and I don't have them for a split second. That's why Paul wrote, you who are trying to be justified by the law, you are severed from grace. You've fallen from grace. You're removed from Christ. Dangerous business, toying with religion, unless you've got the right one. Sin doesn't only bring guilt, it brings incapacity. Whatever I've done, I'm likely to do again. This is the problem with our besetting sins. Unless by grace we overcome them, they'll become too big for us. We must hate our sins, for sin brings incapacity as well as guilt. If you throw a stone, you can't pull it back in mid-flight. And if you've been careless about sin, you'll find it very difficult to come back from sinfulness. Sin brings incapacity as well as guilt. And every sin brings an infinite guilt because we're sinning against an infinite being, God. You're taking your child to church and he's got new shoes and he kicks a stone. Well, you don't like that. But if the pet of the family is there and he kicks that, that's worse. But suppose he kicks his brother. Well, the parents have got to intervene then. But just suppose it was possible for him to kick God. Every sin is an infinite sin because it's done against God. When people abuse you and speak unkindly to you, know that they are doing it to Christ. It'll take away the sting. There are 50, 
14 epistles that have the name of Paul and every one of them finishes with the prayer for grace. And grace is the same Greek word as often translated joy or gift. So the essence of the true gospel is joy, gift, something given us that cannot be earned and it's free and it's a come-as-you-are party. Anyone can have it. Read the prayer at the end of every one of Paul's epistles. Prayer for grace. And we've got to live with grace. The Bible admonishes us to speak with grace. But even to think with grace takes more than I've got. Grace. By nature we do otherwise. Let me read you what Paul wrote about his countrymen and the way they tried to win the favour of God. I'm going to read you from Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? By the way, whenever you find the word righteousness in the New Testament, same Greek word as justification. 999 people out of a 1,000 who sit in church pews don't know that. So when you read in the Bible about righteousness by faith, in the Greek, it's exactly the same as justification by faith. And justification always means declared right, never made righteous. If it meant made righteous, nobody's ever been justified. But the thief on the cross was justified after a life of murder. David was justified after committing adultery and assassination. The Gentiles have found the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. I bear them record they have zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Notice this that the Bible calls the righteousness of God is not my righteousness that I can manufacture. It's not that. For Christ is the end or purpose of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. There's such a tremendous contrast between the two religions, the two Gospels. The wrong one says, this do and you'll live. The true one says, live and you'll do. The wrong one says, pay me what thou owest. The true Gospel says, I freely forgive thee all. The first one emphasises the wages of sin is death. The second one says, but the gift of God is eternal life. The first one, the soul that sinned, it'll die. Second one, he that believeth has everlasting life. The first one, make you a new heart. The second one, a new heart I'll give you. The first one, curses is everyone that continueth not in all the things written of the law to do them. The second one, blessed is he whose sin is forgiven, whose transgression is covered. Oh, what a contrast between law and grace. What a difference between the religion that most people follow. Most people in the church have the wrong religion. That's why the church is impotent, helpless, a scorn to the world. Because most people in the church don't know the gospel. It would be a help if they'd start to read the Bible, but most people never do. Thief on the cross had had lots of law and it hadn't helped him. But when he saw infinite love in the face of Jesus, that changed everything. Here's the heart of true religion. Loving, giving, serving, helping. Or giving. To run and work the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands, 
Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. Have you got it? To run and work the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. I hear the words of love. I gaze upon the blood. I see the mighty sacrifice and I have peace with God. I would not work my soul to save. That the Lord has done. But I would work like any slave for love of God's dear son. The wrong religion in the Bible is called Babylon. And God is always calling his people out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. It began with the Tower of Babel, where stupid men, sinful men, weak men said, come, let us build a tower that will reach under heaven. Let us make us a name. And so they got busy with mud and slime. And the Lord breathed upon it and it went down to nothingness. Every endeavour to get to heaven by your own efforts is mud and slime. It'll never work. It'll never work. Jacob represents the other religion. His name means a twister. Hey, fancy calling your child a twister. It's because he'd taken hold of the heel of his older brother who was getting out of the womb before him. But Jacob knew what he was and when God wrestled with him, he confessed and he said, my name is Twister. I'm a rotter. I'm a crook. God said, I'll give you a new name. Prince was God, overcomer. That's the true religion. When we acknowledge what we are and come to God. When we find the true religion, we're focusing on how God solves the the sin problem. Let me read you from Romans 5. These are very precious verses. These should be read over and over again. Romans 5, and I'm at the end of the chapter. Therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. We were ruined by our first representative, Adam, and we had nothing to do with it. But we were redeemed by our second representative and we had nothing to do with that. Did you get it? If by one man's offence, Adam the first, condemnation, judgment came upon all men, Similarly, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. The whole world's been justified, the whole world's been redeemed, but we're not forced to accept it. We're free to accept it or to deny it. And most men deny it, most women deny it. Moreover, the law entered the obedience that the offence might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What a line. When you're depressed, think of that line. Where sin abounds. Hey, that's my heart. Grace does much more abound. What a text. What a line. What a hope it offers. What good cheer. What gospel. Where sin abounds. Whoosh. Grace does much more abound. That as sin has reigned under death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. This truth, this gospel, explains the most mysterious verses in the Bible, verses at which atheists jeer, at which Christians cheer, not rejoice in wickedness, but cheer themselves with. It says... He wept great drops of blood in Gethsemane. Why should the sinless one weep great drops of blood? Why should he be clutching at the earth, crying according to Hebrews, weeping? Why? Why? It's as though he's afraid of death. Ah, this is a different type of death. He feels the burden of the world's sin falling upon him and removing him from the smile of his father, 
That's why he weeps great drops of blood. That's why on the cross he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those with the gospel understand why, because he had my sin. Remember, we care for no other knowledge in the world than this. Man has sinned, God has suffered. God has become the sin of man, that man might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, the framework of that cross became the desk on which Christ wrote our biography. His flesh was the parchment. The blood was the ink. The quill were the nails. And his wounded hands and feet tell of the things my hands have done that I dare not tell anybody else. The wounds and the feet tell of the places I've gone that I'm ashamed of. And the bleeding brow thinks of the thoughts that I have thought that deserve death. And the wounded side tells of the wrong things I have loved and idolised. So on the cross he wrote my biography and yours. And the cross became a knowledge, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. My evil, his goodness. Adam and Eve in the beginning heard Satan say, take, eat, take, eat of the tree of knowledge. And they did it and were lost. And at the cross, the Spirit of God hovers and says to us, take, eat. And the naked find clothing. The naked Christ on the cross says, I have not a stitch of righteousness. But when I take, Suddenly I have the robe of righteousness. Me, even me, I have a robe of righteousness, spotless. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm complete in him. I'm seated in heavenly places already in the reckoning of God. We've arrived and there's no condemnation. Will I not make fault? Will I not sin again? Oh, yes, I will. I'll always have to pray the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me my trespasses. The New Testament says, and many things we all offend, but there's no condemnation unless we reject the cross of Christ and deliberately pursue a course of known sin. His robe covers us and we are spotless all our days in all our ways. That's the gospel. He became what he was not, that we might become what we're not. Yes, yes accepted in the beloved, complete in him, seated in heavenly places and without condemnation. That is the gospel. Amen. Tell the greatest sinner in the world, you can come. And he says, he that cometh, I'll in no wise cast out. And he says, whosoever will may come. Nobody has sinned so badly they can't come. There's not a sin that can't be rejected. When the Bible talks about the unpardonable sin, it's not talking about a specific act. It's talking about a prolonged attitude until we can no longer hear the pleading voice of God. But every known sin can be forgiven and can be covered by the blood of Christ. The atonement on Calvary is not just one part of Christian doctrine. It's the lifeblood that runs through all biblical theology. It includes and presupposes every other truth. It includes all the things we need to know. All truth is wrapped up in the cross of Christ. All other knowledge except that of the cross is chaff. Well, horse needs some chaff, so do we. But everything apart from the cross is only chaff. <coughs> that cross gives us what we could never earn the decree that we are righteous, justification. Remember, it never, never, never means to make righteous. Sometime read Luke 7.29 and Luke 10.29, which shows that it never means to make righteous. It means to count as righteous. That's the great thing. I can say my prayers at night and I've said many things through the day I haven't, shouldn't have said. I've thought many thoughts I shouldn't have shouldn't have thought. I've left undone a lot of things. I am laden with sin and I come and pray and in his sight I am sinless. And I can go to bed with a clear conscience 
despite what I am, because he's my substitute. He's my saviour. He's my Lord. Amen. Justification. Same word as righteousness. Exactly the same word. But the righteousness that we think of is not the righteousness of God's justification. God's justifying righteousness is 100%, but it's not inside me. It's an alien righteousness. It's in Christ. My righteousness is in heaven. I'm a sinner still, and I've been a Christian over 70 years, stumbling, failing, 70 years, a professed Christian, but accepted in the beloved, complete in him, already seated in heavenly places and without condemnation. So the righteousness of justification is 100%, but it's not inside us. It's an alien righteousness that's in Christ. The righteousness of sanctification, being made righteous, what follows being declared righteous, the change that comes when the Holy Spirit inhabits the tabernacle of Christ, that is real righteousness and it is inside us, but it's never 100%. Are you with me? When you accept Christ, you declare the 100% righteousness. The Spirit comes to live. Now there's a real righteousness, new habits, new attitudes, new behaviour. Hey, I'm doing well. Well, a little bit well. I now have a real righteousness, but it's not 100%. That's why you never look at how well you're doing. The answer is rotten. You never look at how well you're doing. The answer is rotten. You look at what Christ has done and where you are in him. And the answer is magnificent. The righteousness of glorification will be both 100% and inside us. That's when this carnal body is changed. That's when this mortal puts on immortality. That's at the coming of Christ. Only then will there be 100% righteousness that's inside me. In, until then... My faith must be in his righteousness. That's in him. I must trust only in that. And if I do it, it will have an effect on my sanctification because there's no such thing as justification without sanctification. No such thing. But we must remember that by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Let me read you one of the most precious parts of the Bible. I'm reading to you from Ephesians chapter 2. God who's rich in mercy. Hey, other religions don't have mercy. God who's rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. See, he didn't just like us a little bit. His great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, he's quickened us together with Christ. The moment we look to Calvary with faith, we're resurrected spiritually. By grace are you saved and has raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places. There we are. All I've done is look to Jesus like the penitent thief and I'm already in heaven. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should, mo should boast. What a great passage. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone. The faith that saves is faith alone, and yet it's never alone. The faith that saves is not a faith plus works, but it's a faith that works because we are changed when we see Jesus in all his love and goodness and compassion. That does change us. We do become a new creation, not perfect, far from it, but new, different, resolved on his way of life. So salvation comes through the empty hand of a starving beggar laying hold of the sinless Saviour. That's what brings salvation. 
if we could only put away preconceived ideas such as you've got to be good to be saved, ignoring the main Bible truth, that only when you're saved can you become good. If we could only put away preconceived opinions. Read the letters of Paul, which are the cream of the Bible. Christ made the atonement, Paul explained it. Christ nowhere explains the atonement in the Gospels. That was left for Paul. And when he explained the atonement, he explained righteous by faith, justification by faith. Therefore, my friends, if you're going to speak for Christ, one interest must prevail, one subject must swallow up every other, Christ our righteousness, Amen. justification by faith. This is the sweetest melody of human lips. Oh, that we might so sing it that all the world might be set of singing. To help you understand God's Word in a whole new way, go to goodnewsunlimited.com. You can sign up there to get your free devotional delivered to you each day. been paid for by the partners and friends of Good News Unlimited. Word spreads fast.